I encourage you to take your Bible this morning. Let's turn together to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, if you don't have a Bible, there is one there in the pew. Uh, For your use this morning, I would encourage you to take it again, Philippians chapter 3. Now this morning, we're going to read verses 4 through 11, uh, but we're only going to be looking this morning at verses 4 through 8, and we'll continue the rest of this passage next week. Uh, But Philippians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 4 through 11, and if you found your way there, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Again, the Apostle Paul writing, and he says, Although... I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness that which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ." More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You can be seated this morning. I've entitled the message this morning, Balancing the Books. Balancing the Books, and that's because here inside this passage, Uh, Paul uses the language of of accounting, and he talks about the idea of gain and the idea of loss. And it's important for anyone who owns a business or even personally, as you sit down and maybe balance your checkbook, if anybody still has checkbooks in this world that we live in, but you sit down at the end of the month and you begin to look at how much money have we spent, how much money do we have, how much money do we have coming in, and you balance out the books. And it's an important thing to do, and it's something that also we should consider in doing in our lives, looking at the balance sheet of our life. What things are gains to us? What things are losses to us? What things matter and what things don't? And as we look at this passage this morning, we find Paul continuing a thought where we had left off last week. And I want to just remind you of what Paul had been referring to there. Look at verse 2. He says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evildoers, beware of the false circumcision." For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Paul was writing again to confront the Judaizers who were attempting to influence and infiltrate the church at Philippi. And he gave that threefold warning, beware, beware, beware. The Judaizers were those who were attempting to tell the Christians that in order to truly be in Christ, must, not only must you trust in Christ, but you must then also add to that work. Uh, You must follow after the commands of the Old Testament, the Old Testament law, the the judicial law, uh, the, the the Jewish law, and also to follow through in the rite of circumcision. And Paul used a word for circumcision there, and he's speaking of these Judaizers that actually meant mutilate. He said what they're doing actually serves no purpose. They're just mutilating their own bodies in an attempt to pursue fleshly righteousness. But Paul said, we are, those who are in the church, those who are even the church today, we are the true circumcision. Because it's something that happens not on the outside, but what happens on the inside that counts. Paul moves now to verse 4, where we find ourselves this morning in really a moment of autobiography and self-reflection. And what he lays out is who he was before he came to Christ. And the first thing that I want you to notice here is that Paul had a record that was most impressive to the world. A record that was most impressive to the world. Paul says that I myself might have confidence in the flesh. Remember, he had told them, he says, don't put any confidence in the flesh. There's nothing that we can do in our own strength and our own ability that merits any righteousness or favor with God. So Paul says, don't put any trust there. But he said, if anyone could have, he said, it would have been me. He said, if anyone could have confided in the flesh and trusted in their work and trusted in their efforts, he said, I would have been the one who was able to do it. 
Now, it's unlikely that Paul knew the exact names of the Judaizers who were attempting to to, uh, mislead the church here at Philippi. But Paul knew the Judaizers because he had come out of being a Pharisee. He knew their arguments. He knew their beliefs. He knew their thoughts. And he knew that one of the first things that would happen when this letter reached Philippi and began to be read to the church, the Judaizers would hear about it and they'd say, well, of course Paul doesn't trust in the flesh. Of course Paul is telling you to not follow this after because he has nothing to boast in, right? He's not attempting to do these things. So he's just merely telling you that because he can't obtain to these things himself. So it's easier for him to tell you not to do it because he can't even do it himself. And so Paul wants to destroy this argument by laying out the bare facts of who he used to be. Paul is saying, he says, if there's anyone in this world, if anyone who has ever existed could have confidence in the flesh, it would be me. If there's anyone out there who thinks they have enough weight in their record to believe they can accomplish a fleshly work, he says, I can beat them at their own game. Paul really had an uncommon advantage when it came to the game of life. You know, we as humans tend to believe that being born into the right family guarantees the success of our future. That's what we're told in our culture. That it's all about the society or the, the, pers- the family that you're born into is what guarantees it. We often look to the past to judge our future. And what Paul is going to help us to understand is that all of those things, all of those advantages that he had in the worldly standard, in the worldly system, were pointless and worthless when it came to the ultimate value of knowing Christ. So Paul had a record that was most impressive to the world. And I want you to look at this as we go through here in verse 5 and 6. Now, each one of these is just kind of labeled off as as what he's pointing to. And the first thing we notice that he points to there in verse 5 is the procedure. And so he talks really to the idea of circumcision. He starts with circumcision because that was one of the most important things to the Judaizers. The Judaizers said, you must be circumcised to truly be a believer in Christ. So Paul starts there. And he, he understands. Paul knew what circumcision was. It was something that God had given to his people as a sign of their covenant. But it was not to be so much so as a physical thing, although it was a physical thing. Ultimately, what God was doing was causing this physical thing to be a representation of what he was doing on the inside of them. It was a circumcision of the heart. It was a changing of the heart of his people that was symbolized by this outward cutting of flesh. God told his people in Genesis chapter 17, every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or is brought, bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. So the Jewish people had laid out this custom. God had laid it out on the eighth day. A young male would be circumcised. And the reason that Paul points this out is because not only has he been through the ritualistic act of circumcision, but it happened on the eighth day according to the scriptural prescription. And the reason that was important was because Ishmaelites were circumcised in their 13th year. Those who had proselytized or converted to Judaism from Gentile faith were oftentimes circumcised in their adult years, but the Jews were done on the eighth day. So Paul says, if we want to start with circumcision, if we want to start with pursuing these fleshly endeavors and confidence in the flesh, he says, no one can beat me when it comes to circumcision because I have done it on the eighth day as the Bible prescribed exactly how God laid it out to be. So Paul says, let's check that one off the list. You can't beat me there. Secondly, we see his race because Paul says that He was of the nation of Israel. Paul was a Jew by birth. He wasn't a proselyte. He didn't convert to Judaism. There were many who did. There were many who came to the Jewish faith and converted over from leaving false idols and false gods behind. But Paul had been a Jew all the way from birth. His parents were Jews. In fact, he could trace his lineage, his family history, all the way back to their patriarch, Jacob. You remember Jacob's new name was Israel. So as Paul looked at his life, he had completed the rite of circumcision. In the eighth day, his parents had done that for him and given him a leg up on this confidence. But not only that, he was a born of the right race because he was of the nation of Israel. He said, I've been born into the chosen people of God. Didn't come from the outside and come in and be adopted that way, but I was one of the natural born sons. Those who were 
even inside, not even those who converted to Judaism. Some of those who were inside the Jewish faith came from families who were uh, races mixed. So there were some from Israel and some from other tribes and other races of people. They were still Jews, but they weren't a pure stock Jew, as Paul says here. And so Paul points this out. He says, listen, if you want to confide in flesh, if you want to have your confidence there, you need to understand that not only was I circumcised on the eighth day, he says, but as far back as you can trace my family history, all the way back to Jacob, he says, I'm as pure-blooded as a Jew as anyone can be. If we want to talk about following the letter of the law, if we want to talk about following the letter of faith, he says, no one can have a higher claim than me. But not only his race, but then he points to his status. Because he says not only was he of the nation of Israel, but he says he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, if you go back and study your Old Testament history, you remember that under Jeroboam, the tribes of Israel revolted. And of the 12 tribes, there were only two who didn't. There were only two tribes who continued to follow after God, and that was the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And so to be a part of those two tribes was something to hold great pride in, because these were the two who stayed faithful and allegiant to God, even after all the others rebelled. And Paul was a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And this was really one of the highest boasts that any Jew could have. This is the tribe from which King Saul hailed. And interestingly enough, this is most likely where Paul's Jewish name Saul came from. The tribe of Benjamin remained true to God when all others rebelled. So not only was he born into this Jewish faith, but he was born into the right tribe. So we're checking all these things off the list. And everyone we come to, Paul is over and over again saying, listen, you can't find anyone else who's done it better than I did. And some of these things were just, uh, were just by the providence of God. That Paul's family was, was so committed to the faith that they had him circumcised on the eighth day. It was only by God's providence that Paul was born of the nation of Israel and into the tribe of Benjamin. But he goes on and then he talks about his heritage. He said he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, Paul was a full-blooded Jew. He was a Jew through and through. But not only that, Paul had strove all throughout his life to retain not only his Jewishness, but all of the characteristics, customs, and language of his heritage and of his faith. What began to happen as, as the Jews began to spread out all across the, the world, they would move to new places, and oftentimes they would be influenced by the cultures in which they lived. And they would begin to drop their native tongue and stop speaking their native language. They would start picking up practices and customs from other cultures and maybe stop practicing some of the things that they had practiced as young children growing up in Israel. But Paul says, I've not done that. He says, throughout my entire life, he says, I've committed myself to remaining a Hebrew above all Hebrews, a Jew above all Jews, continuing to speak in the native tongue, continuing to practice all the things that we're supposed to do. He says, I'm not like those Hellenistic Jews. Those Jews who were just had come in from the outside, not the native Hebrews. Paul had been trained by one of the most influential teachers at that time, Gamaliel. He had sat at the feet of one of the greatest and most influential teachers. So if anyone knew the Hebrew faith, if anyone knew what it meant to be a citizen of the nation of Israel and to follow after the law, it was Paul. We not only see his heritage, but we also see his religion. As we studied in the Gospel of Matthew, there were two competing groups when it came to the law in Jesus' day. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The latter of those two, the Sadducees, denied the resurrection. They were not truly people of the entirety of sacred scripture because they denied the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were sticklers of the law. They were firm believers in the resurrection. This is why, Jesus, this is why Paul, when he was on trial, he looked around and he saw that there were Sadducees and the other group were there were Pharisees. And he began crying out, brethren, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I'm on trial for the hope and the resurrection of the dead. This was most astoundingly what separated the two. Now the name Pharisee meant separated ones. And the group came into existence, it's believed, sometime during the, the intertestimonial period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Josephus estimated the number of Pharisees in his time at around 6,000 men. So it's a large group of people, but comparatively, it's really not all of that large. 
But the Pharisees believed that every jot and tittle of the Scripture was to be practiced. Every minute point of the Scripture of the law of God was to be kept. But not only did they believe that every part of the law of the Old Testament was to be kept, but they heaped more burdens upon others and themselves by adding countless laws to God's law. They continued to add other things to it, and then they also attempted to keep all of those things. Paul would write in Acts chapter 26, So then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. Paul says, I was a Pharisee above all Pharisees. He says, when it comes to the obedience to the law, when it comes to my religion, he says, you couldn't find anyone who is more committed. You couldn't find anyone who desired to please God in his flesh and in his obedience and in his keeping of the law than Paul was. That's important to understand here that Paul is not listing out all these things in a prideful manner. Now, had you talked to Paul before his conversion, he would most have assuredly listed out all of these things in a prideful manner. But Paul is showing you and showing all of us the, how much work and effort and, and striving someone can put into fleshly endeavors and how you can, you can even get to the point where you are doing everything that you think you ought to be doing. But ultimately, it's not going to matter. Ultimately, it's not going to accomplish everything that you think is going to accomplish. So Paul says, in my religion, I was as committed as anyone could be. But then he goes on, verse 6, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, this really shows Paul's devotion. Now, zeal can be a good thing if focused in the right direction. We see throughout the Bible that zeal is an important characteristic and needed among those who are children of God and to pursue Him in such a proper way. We should have zeal for God. We should pursue Him with exuberance and passion and desire and be excited about the things that God is doing. We need zeal in the church today. We, we need people to be excited about what God has called us to do we need to be, we, we get excited about a lot of things in this world. You know, I'm not, I'm not a big sports fan. It's just never been my thing. But you want to talk about excited people, you go to a sports game. People paint their faces, jump up and down, scream, shout, cry. They're excited, right? You, you see people excited about all sorts of things in this world. They have zeal, they have passion. We need to focus our zeal in the right direction. And Paul said he had zeal, but zeal alone will not save you. It wasn't enough just for Paul to be passionate about his pursuit of the law. It wasn't enough for Paul just to be passionate about his pursuit of obedience. Zeal alone will not save you. Oftentimes, you will meet people who are passionate for Christianity just as the Judaizers were for following after the law but they don't have a true saving faith. You'll meet people who can outwork you, outserve you, outdebate you, and anybody that they cross paths with. But in the end, it's all meaningless. As I was preparing my sermon this week, I got to this point and I began to think about, sadly, how many friends and acquaintances I've had over the years who have abandoned the faith. A few of them. I can think very clearly of a couple in my mind right now as I talk about this who had great zeal for Christianity. They were people at the time who I was sure, based upon their outward demonstration of zeal and passion, that they would be used mightily by God for His kingdom, and now they don't even claim to be in the faith. Because zeal alone will not save you. Passionate pursuit can be an empty endeavor if it's not grounded in the right foundation. Paul knew and understood that although he had meant well, although he had had the greatest of intentions, that what he had been pursuing, his zeal had been an empty pursuit. Paul would write in Romans chapter 10, he says, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. 
He would write to the church at Galatia talking about his former life, how he used to persecute the church. He says, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Paul's zeal was evident in every area of his life. You look at all the things he's listed so far, all the things that he's done. He was so passionate about his pursuit of the law, pursuing his his pharisaical religion. But probably where Paul's zeal was most evident was in his persecution of the church. Because Paul took it to a different level. Paul didn't just pursue this passion for God or this passion for the law on a personal level. He said, I'm so passionate about this that I'm going to be willing to do anything that it takes to exterminate those who call themselves Christian. I think it's such a beautiful picture of God's grace here that Paul, which now so dearly loved the church as to be willing to give his own life for it, had once so strongly hated it that he dedicated his life to exterminating anyone who believed in it. Paul was there when the first Christian martyr, Stephen, was killed. He gave approval to that which was happening. Acts tells us that he began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women and putting them into prison. He would tell of himself and later in Acts, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. Brothers and sisters, it's so easy for us to to read these passages and, and really not think about that. Because we live in a culture where we don't see this happening very often. But I want you to think and put yourself in the position of a family in the New Testament church. And you're there and you're loving the Lord and you're striving to follow after Him and to commit your life to Him and to be obedient to Him. And then all of a sudden, the door kicks open in your house. And here's Paul and those who are with him. He's gotten permission from the church at Jerusalem to come to your town. And he grabs your entire family, drags you off, binds you up, and throws you into prison for your faith. We know that many of them were put to death because of their faith in Christ. This was Paul's doing. He sought permission to do this. This was the zeal that Paul had. Paul says, listen, if you want to look at someone who is passionate as a Pharisee, passionate for the pursuit of the law, passionate and trusting in his flesh. Why ultimately was Paul doing all this? Because he thought by his outward obedience, he thought by his doing fleshly things, physical things, obedient things, he thought that that and that alone would be enough to please God and to provide him a relationship with him. So Paul says, listen, if you want to see one who has done it all, he said, I even went so far in my zeal as to kill other people to prove how passionate I was about the pursuit of God. He goes on then to talk about his legalism. At the end of verse 6, he says, as to righteousness which is in the law found blameless. So Paul was a stickler for the law of the Pharisees. The Pharisees on the outside looked well. They, they, they did what they claimed to do. They committed themselves to this rigid pursuit, not only of the Old Testament law of God, but as I said earlier, to all the extra things that they had added on top of it. That's why Jesus said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus was pointing out, he says, if you want to talk about righteousness, he says, if you want to have righteousness that please God, he says, you have to do it even better than the Pharisees do it. And they're giving everything about their life. They're committing themselves each and every day. Their entire life is focused around this idea of obedience to the law. So Jesus says, if you want to have a righteousness in yourself that pleases God, he says, you've got to do it better than they do. Paul knew the law. He had studied it intently. He had observed it, and he obeyed it every day. He had given himself to this rigid pursuit. There wasn't another Pharisee among them that could out-obey Paul when it came to their rules and regulations. Paul says, when it came to the righteousness as in the law, I was found blameless. Notice what he says there. Not the righteousness, not true righteousness, but he says righteousness which is in the law. 
He says, those things which people think is righteousness by pursuit of the law, he says, I was found blameless. Now, this seems to be an awful, arrogant claim from the Apostle Paul, right? That in righteousness as pursuit to the law, he was found blameless, but this is how committed Paul looked. On the outside, he looked impeccable. He says, I have lived a life as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. One commentator pointed out that Paul had done all that could be done to obtain salvation by the mere observation of the law. Now we know that you can obtain salvation by observation of the law. But if that's what you believe, if you believe that you can do so, Paul says, I was the one who had done it. I had kept enough. I had followed it enough. I was rigid to it enough. Now, Paul was not saying that he had kept the entire law of God, but that he had done everything that was expected by a Pharisaical religion to be saved by an observance of the law. But we understand from the Scriptures, we understand from the words of Jesus and even later from the Apostle Paul that not all was as it seemed because on the outside, Paul had done all of these things. On the outside, he had all of this family history to look back on, his circumcision, his, his race, his heritage, his obedience. He had all these things he could look back on, but on the inside, things were not as perfect as Paul would have desired for them to be. That's why Jesus called out the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, he called to them as hypocrites. He says, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. Paul said when he continued that passage we read earlier, when they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge, he says, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Now, Paul here is going to switch directions. We've talked about a record that was most impressive to the world. Anybody in a worldly system would look at Paul's situation in life and say, how could it get any better? You had kept the law. You had the right family. You had the right lineage. You had everything available to you. You had the greatest education that was available at the time. You've been obedient to the church. You've showed your zeal and your passion for everything that's out there. How could anything get any better? How could you have any better life than what the Apostle Paul did? But what we understand is that a record that is most impressive to the world, secondly, is a record that is deemed a total loss for Christ. You could also say a record that is most impressive to the world, and now we'll see a record that is most impressive to Christ. Because what we want, brothers and sisters, is not a record that is impressive to the world. We want a record that impresses our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because what the world wants us to do and what the world encourages us to pursue is so far from what God desires for us to do. So if we switch directions here, if we switch from something that's most impressive to the world to that which is most impressive to Christ, something had happened in Paul's life. And what happened in Paul's life occurs between the changing of thoughts here. He says, if there was anybody who could put confidence in the flesh, it would have been me. He said, I had accomplished everything that was necessary to put confidence in the flesh. But then in verse 7, there's that three-letter word that makes all the difference. But. He said, anyone else could have trusted, anyone else, no one else could have had greater confidence in the flesh than me. He said, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So what happened in Paul's life? It's in Acts chapter 9. You go to Acts chapter 9 and you remember that Paul was The scripture says, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He asked for permission to go to Damascus that he might bring those men and women there who are following after Christianity back to Jerusalem for trial. And as Paul is on his way there, now brothers and sisters, again, put yourself in Paul's shoes in this moment. He's sitting on his horse. He's riding there to Damascus. And in his mind, Paul is no doubt thinking, man, God sure must be impressed with me. Look at everything that I've done for him. 
I'm on my way there to defend the trueness of the Jewish faith. I'm on my way there to put to death these Christians who are telling us that Jesus is the way and that we must, that he has come to fulfill the law and that we can trust in him. He says, I'm going to put all these men to God must be so pleased with what I'm doing. And we know that suddenly a light from heaven flashed around and Paul fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in the astonishment of this moment, this bright light shining around him, this voice from heaven speaking to him, Paul does the only thing that he can do. He looks up and he says, who are you, Lord? He recognizes that something here is happening outside of his understanding, and he knows that it has to be God. And he says, who, who are you? And Jesus spoke to him and said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. I can't even imagine what happened in Paul's heart in this moment. Right? To, to, to one second be thinking that you're pleasing God by your persecution of the church, and now in the next moment to be seeing this bright light, know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is speaking to you from heaven, and to hear the words of Jesus of Nazareth say to you, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. What a life change. What a radical moment of understanding. What a bit of knowledge that Paul needed to understand the truth about everything that he was doing. Now, Paul was led into the city and Ananias came to him under direction of the Lord and, and took him in. And then God shared with him everything that God was going to do through his life. But Paul's life was forever changed there in a moment on that road to Damascus. That's why the scripture says, if anyone he is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. It was a transformation that happened in the apostle Paul's life. So Paul now knew the words of Jesus to be profoundly true. Remember what Jesus says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Paul now understood what this meant. That he could have pursued all of these things. And in the end, it would have been worthless. But Paul now had a new recognition. That's what he says in verse seven. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He had a new recognition of life. Gain there is in the plural sense, and it refers to assets or profits. Now, Paul was in the human flesh naturally proud of all that he accomplished, but now as Paul looked at the books, as Paul looked at the balanced ledger of his life, he realized that all those things that he had accomplished, all those things he had put hope in, all those things that he had trusted in were worthless. Everything that he had sought Everything that he had given himself to could not justify him. It couldn't save him. It couldn't offer him peace. It couldn't bring him into a right standing with God. And Paul here again is using this accounting terminology. Everything that Paul, if he had balanced his books out, everything that previously had been in the asset or the, 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 the positive column had now been moved, not just to, to, the, to the zero column, but had been moved to the lost column. They were lost. They were worthless. The word counted that Paul uses in this verse is in the perfect tense. And I point that out. You'll see in just a minute why. It's in the perfect tense, which means that it's at some point in the past, Paul had come to this conclusion. He had looked at his life and realized that everything that was gained to him had now been counted as a loss. But not only had he done that in the past, that even now as he wrote this letter, he still came to the same conclusion that all things were counted for loss. But why? And he tells us there at the end of verse seven, he says, for the sake of Christ. Everything that he had been chasing in his fleshly pursuit of obedience, he found totally and completely in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul had given his entire life thinking that he could do it on his own. And in that moment on the road to Damascus, Paul realized that everything that he had been chasing after was found instantly in a moment in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Paul was not regretful of this. Instead, he was at perfect peace and contentment. We think about a loss of something being a negative thing, but Paul looked at the loss of all those things as in fact being a positive thing because of what he gained on the other side. He says, I can throw all of that away 
because I now know who Christ is. In the early part of the 20th century, there was a young man named William Borden. William Borden felt the call of God to go to the mission field. And he came from a very, very wealthy family. And had he finished college and went to work, he would have had a life of relative ease ahead of him. But William Borden could not say no to the call of God. As he left his family's wealth behind him and told them that he was not going to pursue the family the family ventures, he wrote in the back of his Bible two words, no reserve. Now, as he finished college, his friends told him, you know, Borden, you're throwing your life away. You know, you should stay here and, and go to work and, 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 and fulfill, fulfill the legacy of your family. After he graduated college, he was offered several influential positions, several jobs that would have paid large sums of money. And he turned all those down. And after he did so, he penned these next two words, no retreats. Now, Borden felt called to go to a specific Muslim group in China. So he left the U.S. after college to go to Egypt to study Arabic. And while he was there, he contracted meningitis and died at the age of 25 before ever setting foot on the mission field. And sometime before his death, he penned these final two words beside the others that he had written, no regrets, no reserve, no retreats, no regrets. This was the mindset of the Apostle Paul. As he looked back over his life, he had no reservations about what he had done. He had no reservations about everything that he had committed to Christ. He had no retreats. He wasn't looking for a way out. And Paul could come to the end and say, everything that I've done has been worth it all to lose it all for the sake of knowing who Jesus is, for knowing him in the fullness of his power, for knowing him in the forgiveness of sin, for knowing him in resurrection and life, and for knowing him in the pursuit of obedience to him. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Jesus says this man knew the value and the worth of the treasure, so he sold everything that he had to get it. Paul says, it's willing for me to throw away everything that I've done, for none of it to be counted as worth that I may know the great value and the treasure of who Jesus is. But Paul also had a new mindset. Look at verse 8. He says, More than that, I count all things to be lost in my view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Now, I said earlier that Paul had used the word count in the previous verse. It was in the perfect tense, but now here it's in the present tense. He had counted all things as loss, and now as he's balancing the books again, he still counts all things as loss. Acts chapter 20, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was not willing only to count those past things as lost, but he was also willing to consider anything as lost that would hinder him in his pursuit of Christ. Paul wasn't just throwing out the balances in the past life, but every day he was looking at his life and considering what can I do to get rid of those things and to count them as lost, which would hinder me in my obedience to Christ. Paul's perspective had changed. He had a knowledge now that he did not know before. He says the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. No longer was he pursuing self as ambition, but now he knew the supreme value of having Jesus Christ. I enjoy sometimes watching a show called Antiques Roadshow. If you've ever seen the show, it features individuals who uh, come to a place. There's a lot of antique appraisers there, and they bring items in to, to evaluate. Sometimes it's something that's been passed down to them from a family member or something they found at a junk store somewhere. And from time to time, they have someone who comes in with an item that quite literally takes the breath away of the appraiser. They set it on the table, and whoever it is, they walk over, and you can see the astonished look in their eyes because the appraiser knows the value. They have the right knowledge and understanding. So they'll go over the history of the item. They'll talk about its maker, its use, its history. And then at the end, they'll reveal the value to that person. And once they relate the value to the owner, then the owner too is oftentimes speechless in shock. 
Now, what's changed? The item hasn't changed. But what changed was the knowledge that the person had about the item. And because they have a new knowledge now, then everything is different. And brothers and sisters, this is what Paul is saying. He said, I had lived my entire life in pursuit of one thing that I thought was valuable. He said, but once I had the knowledge of who Jesus is, I realized that everything else is worthless and that he is the only priceless thing that I need to pursue. Once we know the value, our perspective changes. The knowledge of Christ changes things about how we view this world. Paul wrote to the church at Colossae and he said that their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. That is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. John wrote in 1 John chapter 5, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Paul now knew the value of a relationship with Christ and that there was nothing in this world that could compare to it. Of everything that he had pursued, of everything that he had given his life for, now only one thing remained on the positive side of the balanced books of Paul's life, and that was Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This was Paul's only hope. This was Paul's only desire. He said, I don't want you to know anything else about me. I don't want you to care anything else about who I am, except this one thing, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul also had a new assessment of his life because he goes on there in verse eight. He says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. This is a picture of sailors who are willing to throw overboard the contents of their ship in order to save themselves from the storm. You remember this actually happened to Paul as as he was on his way on one of his missionary journeys, a violent storm came in and they began to toss the cargo overboard in order to save the ship. They were willing to toss everything that the world would view as, as, as potential value in order to save their own lives. And Paul's saying, I'm willing to give up anything in this life because I know that ultimately my life is secure. I'm willing to suffer the loss of everything. And what had Paul experienced? What losses had he had? He points them out in 2 Corinthians. He had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked. He had been stoned. He had been whipped. He had been in prison. He had been in loss. He had been in danger from the river, danger from his countrymen, danger from the city, danger in the wilderness, false accusations, loss of reputation. Paul had given it all up. He said, it's all loss for the case of Christ. I'm willing to suffer all of it. The disciples lost some of their families. They were ridiculed. They were persecuted. The New Testament church were persecuted. Their families abandoned them, disregarded them. But all of it was worth it. Why? Because of Jesus. Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things. It was a continual thing in Paul's mind. He knew that at times in his life, he was going to have to be willing to lay anything and everything down for the cause of Christ. But Paul also had a new evaluation because he says there in the end of verse eight, and count them but rubbish. Now the word rubbish can be converted to dregs or refuse or dung. It's something that's to be thrown away. There's no stronger word that Paul could have used here in this moment to describe how worthless he saw the outward and self-centered pursuit of salvation. He says, I look back at all these things that I had done, all these things that I had pursued after, all these things that I had thought were important in my life. And he said, they are not just worthless. He said, but they're the lowest level of worthless that you can think of. William Barclay in his commentary said it this way, quote, so then Paul is saying, I found the law and all its ways of no more use than the refuse thrown on the garbage heap to help me to try to get into a right relationship with God. So I gave up trying to create a goodness of my own. I came to God in humble faith that Jesus had told me to do, and I found that fellowship I had sought so long, end quote. Paul says, I don't regret it. 
I don't look back and wish that I had those things back because why? He had a new evaluation of them. He didn't long to have those things back. How many of you, when you go to the garbage dump, you take that big bag of smelly trash full of garbage and old food scraps and rotten meat and you throw it in the dumpster? How many of you drive away in about five minutes? You know what? I need to go get that back. You know, I really, really like that bag of garbage. So I'm going to go back there, pull it out of the dumpster and take it back home with me. You never do that. So Paul looks at his life in that same evaluation. He says all of those things are as the smelliest, most disgusting bag of garbage. He said, I don't want anything to do with those things anymore. I look at all of it as lost. Consider it as rubbish. And why finally? Because Paul had a new goal, that I may gain Christ. One commentator said, no one who has laid down all things for Christ ever seems dissatisfied with the exchange. On the contrary, those who have done so seem possessed of a joy unknown to others. Paul says, I'm willing to throw it all away so that I may gain Christ. Paul had this self-centered pursuit at the beginning of his life, hoping to obtain all of these other things. He says, the greatest thing that I've found that I want and that I need and that I'm willing to give it all for is that I may know Christ. To gain Christ means to have a right relationship with him. And if you're here this morning, this is the greatest thing that you need if you do not have it. If you're here this morning and you're trusting in your obedience to have a right relationship with Christ, to gain Christ, Paul would tell you, throw it away. If you're here this morning and you're trusting in the fact that you were born into a Christian family to obtain right relationship with God, Paul would tell you to throw it away. If you're here trusting because you are zealous, you, you have great passion, and you think that your great passion is a demonstrator of God's obedience, or that God will, will, will grant you his forgiveness because of your passion, Paul would say to throw it away. Paul would say throw it all away and cling to the only one who can give you what you need, and that is Jesus Christ alone. Throw away the pursuit of self. Throw away the pursuit of the flesh. Don't have any confidence in the flesh. Can you imagine now how much greater that line meant to the church at Philippi? He says, don't have any confidence in the flesh. And then he lays it out. There's no one at Philippi who at the end of this passage could stand up and say, well, Paul, yeah, I understand, but you don't know me. I... Paul says, there, you, none of you can be any greater than I was in a pursuit of fleshly obedience. He says, but throw it all away so that you can gain Christ. Throw it all away that you may know him in his fullness. Throw it all away that you may be obedient to him in pursuit of what God has called you to do. Paul was willing to lose everything, not only his heritage, not only his history, not only his uh, his confidence in the flesh, but Paul was even willing to lay down everything else for the sake of knowing Christ. Hebrews tell us that we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. John tells us in 1 John, what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You can know Him in the fullness of His power this morning, but you must balance the books. You must look at the ledger of your life and make sure that the only thing you're counting in the gain column is that which you have in Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Father, we thank you that we cannot have confidence in the flesh. We thank you, Lord, that we know our own lives and understand that we can never measure up to your righteousness. But, oh, Lord, we are thankful that we don't have to because Christ has done it for us that his righteousness has been credited to our account. Not because we did anything, but because you loved us. We love you because you first loved us. 
You chose us, you called us, you elected us before the foundation of the world. And Christ's obedient sacrifice has been credited to our account. We now know forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. We have been justified before you because of everything and only because of everything that Christ has done. Lord, help us to balance the books of our life. We can be tempted, Father, even as Christians, to put our trust in the things that we do, the things that we've accomplished. But Lord, help us to realize the only hope, the only gain that we have is that in knowing your Son. And I pray this morning, Lord, if there's anyone here who's never balanced the eternal books of their life and put Christ in their life, repented of their sins, trusted in Him alone for salvation, that today would be the day. May your Spirit move upon their heart, draw them to you. And Lord, for those of us who are believers, Lord, help us each and every day to look at our lives and to be willing, Father, to count all things as loss for the surpassing value of knowing your Son. Let us be willing to lay it all aside, to lay it all down, that we may know him more fully. And we ask all these things this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.